going to record. Recording has started. Hi, uh, everybody. Welcome for this new Jenkins Infra meeting. Um, we have really, I mean, we have few topic that I, I, we want that we that we'll cover during during this infrastructure meeting. So the first one is Damien solved the LDAP issues we had for a while. Um, just to bring the context, um, we are we are using multiple Jenkins instance in the Jenkins project, and few of them. Each time we try to log in, we got um, a timeout um, issues. So after twenty seconds, um, our authentication was rejected. And the thing is, the configuration was apparently not almost the same um, than on CI the Jenkins that I use. But the problems, I mean, appear like two weeks ago, uh, and Damien did um, spend quite a lot of time investigating to try to understand what was wrong there. So maybe Damien, you can just explain a little bit more. Yes, so uh, based on uh, some feedback from team first, in fact, it's been months that the issue were, was happening some time to time, but it started happening more and more recently. Um, so the we tried different uh, different areas that are all written on the as associated Jira issue. Uh, so the conclusion is where we had to use this exactly the same uh, Jenkins cast configuration as what we have on CI Jenkins IO, which currently work. Uh, and in fact, we had to specify some search pays. So the requests to the LDAP were not made from the root DN, but were made through the search pays. So instead of searching the whole area, it was on a sub part of the tree. Since we have a lot of entries in LDAP, the issue is that when Jenkins was sending a request, the time to process the request on the LDAP side and the size of the request when it was not time muted from the client side, uh, that size was not uh, able to be treated in time in less than one minute. So the result was we had a, a stack and a HTTP 500 error from Jenkins because timeout. So by specifying the correct search base for both user and group, and also adding an insensitive case filter to improve the, the usage of the LDAP index, then we were able to have uh, the correct request working. So it take almost 10 to 12 seconds the first time after a restart, time to populate the cache. And then Jenkins has his cache populated and it works very well. Um, it's um, a bit slower on GDK 11 though, than on GDK 8. And it looks like there are still some open issue on the LDAP plugin with GDK 11, where some class on the class loader are not there. Uh, so it it um, it writes some warnings on the log, but it's just it's eight it's eleven it's ten seconds more for the initial request and then no difference, but it's a bit slower in GDK eleven for the initial request. And one one of the things that we noticed was um, the 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 member attribute in the group was not indexed, so we also mm -hmm. saw many errors. Um, so this is something that we could easily add to the to the LDAP container. I mean, that's one line configuration. The only thing is the first time that we index that new member attribute, it will take like 20 minutes. So the LDAP would be done for 20, 20 minutes. Um, Damien, do you think that we still have to do that or? Um, no, it's not, uh, it, it should be okay, even though it could be good for the EGN of the request uh, to have the index on these attributes because we have a lot of, uh, um, request coming from CI release and infra CI. Okay. Another point was that the airbag model that we are using on infra CI, assuming it's behind a VPN, is that administration is granted to everyone in the group admin. And there are some read only access to view the jobs to people part of a group named all. And by switching that group all to authenticated, which is the authenticated virtual group in Jenkins, meaning anyone able to authenticate through a realm. Then also I was able to, to decrease the initial request time from 12 seconds to six seconds. So this is this was a tip from, um, from, uh, uh, from our uh, Daniel Beck. Uh, and it looked also a good idea in the sense that even if the instance is behind the VPN, um, an authenticated access should be prohibited because it has access to all the infrastructure. 
the, the let's say the threat for this case would be when a process run somewhere on the cluster or when um, one of the agent of InfraCI or release are executing a process, a malicious process that already has access to the internal network of Kubernetes. So it doesn't change anything on the usage. We only have to be sure that someone has an account in LDAP if they want to access InfraCI and read it. It's that you must authenticate with a valid to be sure you can read the list of uh, jobs. That's the only we but, can. But, uh, but right now you remove the group. So the idea in the past was to allow every member of the group all to, to have read any access to those Jenkins mm -hmm. instance. So in this case, you only, I mean, in order to authenticate, you need to be in the admin group. So we lost you, Damien. Sorry, no, it's not what the airbag rule says. The airbag rule says, if the current authenticated user is member of a group admin, then it's granted the admin rights. Otherwise, if it's only authenticated, then it, it's granted the rest of the rights. Okay, okay. You, it's inverted logic, so co compared to what you said. So with this, it looks like that InfraCI is able uh, to, to work again. So I encourage you, everyone who have access to test it. And tomorrow, I will wait uh, 24 hours. If everything is going right on InfraCI with this new setup, I will propagate the setup to the release.ci uh, instance as well. So specifically for the release, so the, the release was not affected in the fact that it's still working. So normally a weekly release would have been published now. So it would be nice to double check that. Because if we don't have, I mean, if something happened uh, there, we may have to, to temporarily uh, put that, uh, that configuration to the release environment as well. I'm not able to access since today's to the release instance. Either no, I had five or three and five or four. Maybe it's another. Uh, it looks like it might be another issue, but uh, in any case, I will wait for tomorrow. We need uh, at least one full day of trying on InfraCI to be sure we can add this uh, same set. So basically, what I'm wondering. Okay, right. So Debian Debian package was pushed today, several hours ago. And Datadog haven't complained, so I guess that every packages are available. So I think every, everything went fine. So it should be I've okay. I've been having issues downloading Docker images for the new weekly version. Yeah, it's not days. available. Yeah, it's not weekly? available. But yeah. the, weekly, the weekly is not built on infra.ci, right? It's still built on trusted.ci. So it's a different issue. And usually the, the Docker image take more time Build. Yeah, part of the weekly release checklist is to invoke the Docker container build interactively. So, so, but you're saying that the weekly has been delivered. We've seen that. We just don't have a container for it yet. Is that what you said, Gareth? I think that's the case. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I guess so we could we could simplify the process by moving that job to uh, release.ci. I think it would be easier to do, yeah, to do everything in one location instead of having, uh, instead of having to lock connect and trust that CI. Yeah. Does that then? Well, yeah. So does that then block people who, who Alex Earl, for instance, from seeing status that he could see before? That now that it's moved, if it moved to release.ci, he can't see it any longer. Uh, technically, for Daniel, it should be for Alex. It should be fine. Okay. Because I guess he's still in the right group, but yeah, definitely. Yeah. No, I, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't worry because anyway, really little people. I mean, a really few people have access to trusted CI. So for those, the, for the people who have access to trusted CI, we could easily grant them access to really the CI. Um, Got it. Maybe not. Um, maybe not. Maybe they won't be able to trigger a build or a job, but at least they, they should be able to, to watch the results. Um, right. Um, is that all on the LDAP topic? Yep. Thanks. Uh, let's move to another topic. So the next one that I want to bring is to Captain Hook. So this is a small project that Garrett have been working on. Um, we haven't deployed yet, so we haven't tested yet at the moment, but yet the bear is pending. Maybe Garrett, you want to explain a little bit the thing? Yeah, sure. So it came out of the Contributor Summit on the Cloud Native track um, with one of the 
frustrations of running Jenkins in a Elm or a Docker environment was that when it's restarted, you tend to lose webhooks. And if you're trying to continuously continuously deliver Jenkins, it's restarted quite a bit, um, especially if you're using um, the process of building the plugins into the Docker image and doing it that way. Um, so the idea is just, it was a simple, sort of a very much lightweight webhook handler that could store and forward webhook events on GitHub to Jenkins, um, or, or in, in theory, from anything to Jenkins. Um, so I can paste the link to the actual repo in here. It seems to be working quite nicely. I have it on a test cluster, um, and hooks are being stored or forward. I can take Jenkins down for a period of time, and then when it comes back up, they, they all nicely recover. Um, it adds the hooks in as a CRD, so you can debug what's going on by doing kubectl get hooks. And you'll, you'll see a list of all the hooks that are there and the status of them. Um, so you could add something to force a re-trigger of a particular one, or at least you'll see the error message about a hook is being rejected or not. Um, and I think that's about it. It, it. it probably is ready to go into infra. Um, at least for a bit of testing, because we can test on a on a subset of repositories. Um, the, I suppose that questions are: Should we use a different ingress host, and then do we need some firewall rules to allow that host through, or something else? Um, maybe some DNS settings to, if there is a new host name for that particular endpoint. The reason the build is failing at the moment actually is because it's unable to generate the diff comment and I don't know why, but now that I can get back into infra, I can at least investigate it. <laughs> so regarding uh, having a different ingress, I think we definitely need a different ingress. Adding a new DNS name is pretty easy. So maybe you can just take like 30 minutes and do that together. Oh. Uh, we just have to decide on the name, but yeah. So does does that mean that when you add the new DNS name that that GitHub will be told what that location is and will send webhooks to there in addition? Is that how that works? So you could either configure it. I, I would probably recommend configuring it on a repo by repo basis initially to so ones that we let's start off with some repositories that aren't particularly important. Um, just to see that they are going across, because if it, if it starts to fail, we don't want to break too much um, to update those manually. Uh, apparently, there is a process in, I think, the GitHub branch source plugin, or one of the plugins where you can specify a different webhook endpoint and tell it to update everything. Um, although, I think, from my investigation, the way that we have infra and releases configured, it needs a different style of credential to be able to handle that. Um, I'm not quite sure. So the, the way we are doing it on most of the jobs is using a GitHub organization. In the case of the GitHub organization, I don't know for multi-branch, but in the case of GitHub org, either you're using a OAuth token or a GitHub app. In both cases, the GitHub organization has authentication and the rights to create the webhooks. Um, by default, you try to create it at the organization level, which means you don't see a webhook per repository by default. And it is a organization level webhook that say each time there is a repository in that org that has a new pull request, whatever event you select, then it will send. So the configuration is centralized. I know for a fact that the multi-branch webhooks should uh, create automatically webhooks if you define a GitHub source. But in reality, that's a, a really a pain. And I'm not really sure if it's working as for today. It wasn't past year. During all the year, it was yeah. not working on the LTS. So this is something to be checked. That's a good point you're doing, Mark, because it's really a pain to manually uh, uh, check the webhooks. I expect when I create a job, the webhooks to be created or to tell me it's not with a message which the GitHub organization scanning is doing correctly. But yeah, 
we have to check and you are correct i'm sure the github organization is able to specify another endpoint we have to add the webhooks manually for most of the docker repos they but how does that work webhooks. how does that work when you have so you so you basically you receive two different webhooks uh, you have the, the classic one that arrive uh, right now and then we would have the second one that just handled um, when Jenkins is down, like a cache, or is it something that's... Um... So yeah. basically you would, you would receive two, two, two kind of web books at the same time, and that's on infra.ci. And I, I think if, that we, was... if, we, if we, that's if we have the organizational level hooks installed. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know, I, I have, we have no access at the organizational level to see or debug whether or not that is even happening. My inkling is that it's not happening because um, there's none of the repos that are getting webhook events anyway, um, unless you you actually go in and manually define um, on, on a per repo basis. Which, which we, we should not have to do unless we, we have one multi-branch job per repo. Um, I think, I think it could be because there's it's yeah. the difference in the credential type. Um, there's, there's something there's something to do with that, like the, the bit that updates the webhook at the organizational level can only handle a particular credential type and we're using a different one. Mm. Uh, that's, that's why you can't invoke it manually to step that piece. Okay, I took the, we had to configure a GitHub server on the main Manage Jenkins page one time, link to the GitHub server. And then when you create a multi-branch GitHub source, in fact, internally, it, it tells the Jenkins administration to declare the webhooks through this kind of internal proxy. So it was not directly the multi-branch in itself, as far as I remember. And th no. this is this kind of internal settings that sometimes pop up an administration monitor message that say, hey, I was not able to create uh, whatever webhooks event because blah, blah, blah. And sometimes you have a bunch after a restart. But yeah, we, we have to check all the cases because there are a lot of cases depending on kind of jobs. This one is really tricky. <laughs> and what happened if that, um, to answer your question, Olivier, if you have a, a webhooks that come from uh, Captain Hook and another, it will trigger two scans on each repository changed. And Jenkins will determine that there is no build to run again because if the first one trigger a build on a given commit, then the second scan will say nothing to do. So okay, it's not right. an issue at all. We can okay. have uh, multiple concurrent uh, different webhooks. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Um, right, so I guess we are good on the Captain Hook. Topic. Um, the next one is brief. Um, so Mark sent published a blog post about um, the, the update center certificate rotation. So the initial date was proposed to do it on next week on the 22, but because of the time we took to finalize that blog post, uh, we'll do that on the 29. Um, generating the new certificate is pretty simple. Uh, we just have to modify uh, trusted.ci with a new certificate. So the next time the update center generate its data, it use the correct certificate. Um, again, um, it won't affect, um, I mean, it won't affect user who have been updating that Jenkins instance for the past two years. So, I mean, that should be fine, but yeah, that, that, that remains a pretty big change anyway. But, um, Next topic, which is about on duty experience improvements. So, Mark, you had a session with Garrett and Mark um, two days ago, I think, about Datadog and pager duty. Do you want to share that here? Yeah, just that that what we did was we went through a a series of exercises trying to understand what we could do to reduce the alert frequency or re refine the alert frequency of things coming from Datadog. So I had received um, an alert on a weird response time. And so with Damien and with Gareth, we went through, talked about it and thought, okay, what we probably ought to consider is rather than monitoring on HTTP response time, long-term, let's shift our monitoring to something higher level 
something closer to the user because the short term HTTP response time wasn't actually an indication of, of a user problem. It was it was just a hint. And and now what what Gareth noted is now that Datadog has the notion of SLOs and we can use those and give ourselves a, a, a more accurate, more reliable alerting. Gareth, did I say that reasonably? Did I miss something? Yep. No, that's, yeah, that's all good. In the so, short yeah. term, I think we may just adjust the thresholds. And and there, I think Damien now knows how to adjust thresholds through the through Terraform changes. Sorry, and that's all that I had. Yep. So, so just mentioning the thresholds. So um, we have we had quite a lot of notification about service getting slow over the past few weeks, and most of the time those issues appear and goes pretty quickly, and it's just like a, a small peak in the in the usage. The challenge that we have here is so we are using Datadog to monitor to monitor the HTTP endpoints, and historically we were just monitoring each. Point, um, endpoint from one machine from the Puppet Master. So that machine was configured to ping um, the main website, plugin site, and so on. Several weeks ago, what we did is we also configured the Datadog agent running on, the, on our Kubernetes cluster to ping those endpoints, which means that now instead of just pinging, uh, just checking um, if those services were up from one location, we are doing that from that location, but also from the Kubernetes cluster. And at the same time, we are also using Datadog Synthetic. In that case, that's Datadog who provides the monitoring agent and check from, I think, from Germany. But the challenge that we have here is because we are checking um, if one endpoint is available or not from one location, typically websites located in the US are pretty responsive. Um, usually they, 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 under, they under the request but once again. But at the same time, services that are like closer to China, like mirrors in China, um, they usually take three seconds from the US to answer the, um, the loads to answer the request, sorry. And so, yeah, that, that threshold can be tricky to put in place um, depending on how close the, the monitoring agent is from the service. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's oh, definitely true. Don't forget, it's not the thresholds that we are looking for. Yeah. This is what the SLO defines. So we should not change. The threshold is, a ver is the vertical measure on the graph. It is really easy. While what we want with the SLO is to say, if these peaks happen too often, so on different props, then it means that it impacts the user. And then in that case, it should awake or raise an alert and awake someone. So this is a second level of aggregating different props, results, and um, applying more than just an average, because the average I'm, I'm, function is not enough there. I, I was just explaining where the data were coming from and that we have to, to keep them Okay, in thanks. Mind. Just wanted to be sure there were no misunderstandings. Um, so yeah, and last topic, which is uh, infra budget update from a lake um, that we want to bring that topic here. Um, is there anything new that you, or, uh, yeah. just a uh, quick update, but uh, good news. So CDF uh, board has reviewed uh, the 2021 budget. They confirmed uh, that uh, we can proceed with the budget from 2020. So what it means is that we still have uh, 10K um, a year for Asia sponsorship plus some additional expenses uh, if we need. Um, there is a disclaimer that uh, they might um, reach out um, and to see changes if there are more projects joining the continuous delivery foundation and requiring an infrastructure budget. But for now, we should be fine. And from what I've seen in the Asia console, we are well below the limit. So yeah, good news so, for everyone. So that's a great news. And basically what you're telling us is we should really pay attention to not accept new projects in the CF, right? <laughs> it's not what I said. <laughs> Right. Uh, yeah, that's perfect. That's a really good news because that means that we wouldn't have to pay too much attention. Um, I mean, la last 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 year we spent quite a lot of time reducing the costs, and uh, yeah, that that's really nice that we can work on other things. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, of course, the CDF would appreciate if we keep reducing our costs. Yeah. Obvi uh, obviously. But, but... Uh, yeah, there is no strong pressure to hit a lower budget target at the moment. 
That's great. Any, anyway, our objective is always to be less, to less rely on sponsoring, uh, so we can have. You know, I mean, less we less we have to pay for, uh, better it is because if we don't have, I mean, if you don't have pressure to reduce the cost, um, if we have, yeah, if we have, don't have strong pressure to reduce the cost, that means that we can plan more in advance. So, but that's definitely great news. Yeah, we can uh, add more services if needed. For example, with the spending proposal about. Uh, uh, security scans, which may require some more tools on our infrastructure. There is also uh, plugin delivery pipeline, which is definitely uh, expected to happen on our infrastructure. And uh, since we have some uh, budget now, we can use so we can fund these efforts. Yeah, what what I notice is we usually get right now between eight k and nine 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 thousand. Usually, that's. I mean, some time ago, a bit above the 9K, but um, that's nice to know that, uh, yeah. Thanks, thanks everybody. Thanks for your time. Um, we have two minutes left before the end of the meeting. So um, if you want to bring a last topic, that's a nice moment. I need help on the budget part to evaluate how much we should ask for scale way. Uh, taking in account that given the last mail, I'm not sure they will give things for free. It looks like they are going to give us a, a reduction a of the cost, a discount. So uh, I might need help on evaluating how much and guiding me uh, based on the... Uh, now that I'm sure that we have a 10K per month, I will have, a, let's say, a measurement of what the big cloud provider can give us. So let's say targeting 5% of that, for instance, could be a, a great way. Uh, um, if you need, or, we have. Yep. If you need, we have a document. We have a Google. We have a cheat document where we list all the costs and sponsoring and so on. Um, this is not a document that I share publicly, but uh, I mean, if you, I mean, I'm, I would be more than happy to to grant you access to that. If scaleway so, is just a discount, uh, it's unlikely that we would press it there. Uh, when there is opportunity to get uh, basically credits uh, from other providers. No, I'm not sure to get you. Yeah, so Scaleway is basically a French hosting provider, right? Yes. Austria and uh, Holland as well. And uh, uh, Bangkok or Singapore. Uh, Diamond correctly, uh, there is no sponsorship offered. There is a discount offered. It's not that clear. So we have to ask. That means we have to ask uh, until they don't say no, I consider that they can still sponsor. But I feel like that we're going to the discount way. So in that case, it will be more complicated. But well, and, that's, and that's con oh, Sorry, go ahead. That's roughly, roughly akin to what we've seen with Oracle is Oracle's offered us a discount, same, same thing. So it's worth considering. They've also donated 1500 to the project outright, but 1500 in terms of our infrastructure costs is a tiny amount, right? We, we have 10,000 a month that we're spending at, at Azure. And I would guess comparable to that from AWS right now, right? So, so we've, got, we've got significant expenses, but it's, it's worth at least evaluating. Continue the question so, to scale away, yeah. So, so right, right now we are spending around, I mean, close to, to, to 20 to 20k per month um, the Jenkins infra project as zero represent half of the cost um, the thing is it it's I mean it takes time to put in place a billing process so if we just have a discount that's annoying because then it means that we have to work with the Linux foundation to, to I mean to have to have invoices and stuff like that and so if we have to go with the invoice oh uh, sorry with the with a discount which is something possible but then we have to be sure that um it's worthwhile so let's say we i mean if it if the benefit is just to have a discount for one year um it probably not worthwhile to to spend the time there but otherwise yeah it may it, it may be useful to have a discount as well um but um, I think we'll have a better vision once, once so Damien, once you're done with the Amazon cluster. So once this is working and we can use it on the CI CI.jtk.io, it will already be easier to identify uh, how much. I've, for information on the issue, on the Jira issue, if you are interested on this, I've already made some measurements and uh, predictions on the cost and the kind of machines. One of the, 
uh, area I want to explore is using machines that are not using EBS. Uh, the, this is the block storage mounted for persistence between machines. Given that the goal of these clusters is only to bring up um, ephemeral agents and switching to machines that have NVMe local drives instead, which AWS provides, which Scaleway provides, and GCP as well, because you don't have to pay for the EBS. So what is uh, the added cost of the NVMe machines is gained on the EBS roughly per month. Um, the cost is uh, should be at least half of what we spend on the a ACI cluster for CI Jenkins iOS for today. And the performances are already one grade upper. And also we are not tied to a cloud provider specific block storage. So in that case, we have a perfect, we have the context to try to avoid this. So better having a fast drives for that. Thanks. Um, I just have one last topic that I just want to bring. Uh, I don't think I mentioned it, but so I worked on Kicklock uh, over the past week um, to, to, to update it. And I would need some help from someone um, with Java experience, because one of the limits that we had to replace Kicklock, uh, to replace the account app by Kicklock, was um, the rules that we put in place for the username, I mean, during the registration process. And Kicklock allow us to override the class that define the registration process. So we could inject um, just some piece of code from the account app into Kicklock. So we, we would be able to finalize the migration from um, account app to Kicklock. So I put the documentation um, here. I, I, won't, I won't spend too much time here. So I put the documentation here. Um, but yeah, if someone is willing to give me an, an app here, just to identify how much effort is needed to do that, I would be more than happy. So basically, the two the two last elements that are missing to officially use Kicklock is first for Daniel, um, the account app automatically inject user in Jira, which is not um, done by default um, because of the way the, um, the LDAP um, plugin, um, the, the way the LDAP connector work on Jira. And the second thing is um, the account app ensure that we don't use specific names like um, admins and stuff like that in the username. And so this is also something that need to be added, that need to be put that need to be added for the yeah, for Kicklock. But yeah. Um, that's it for me. Um, I propose to finish the meeting. We are a little bit over the time. So thanks everybody for staying until now and uh, see you. Bye bye.